Right, we better get started then. So today is the second of these two lectures that I'm giving you. Um, this one I've entitled Waking the Dead, not very original title, um, and subtitle is Archaic Hominin Genes and Genomes. And I changed the title just yesterday. Uh, I've got some papers in here that have appeared in the last 24 hours, so it's very, very up to date. Uh, and that gives you a measure of how exciting this field is. I am trying to record this. I tried to record last time's lecture uh, as, a, pod, as a, a slide cast, but somehow it didn't work. In fact, if you look on my YouTube uh, channel, the, the, the last time I gave the lecture is still up there, and most of the material for that previous lecture is the same. This one, there's quite a lot of new stuff in it. So at the end of this, I uh, hope you'll understand who the Neanderthals were, what their relationship is to us, um, and evaluate the evidence for making those uh, statements. And also, and this is the, the kind of stock press in a way, is look at the contribution of other uh, archaic hominins to the uh, modern human gene pool. So we start by thinking about the Neanderthals. Uh, now, Neanderthal is actually the name of a place, it's the name of a valley, it means Neander Valley in German, and it was named after a local pastor called uh, Neumann, and I think they just thought it was a, a cool thing to do to give it the Greek name, so it's Neander just means Neumann, Neumann in, uh, in Greek, and then Tal is valley. The Germans changed their spelling system, modernized it in 1901, um, and so the old form with the H in is used in the, if you use the term Homo neanderthalensis, which is the way taxonomy works, you're supposed to stick with what you started with. But um, the modern spelling is without the H, and one of the annoying things in this field is that both forms are used um, in papers. And in fact, if you look in science, they use it without an H. If you look in nature, they use it with an H. It's a British US thing. Uh, and if you go and do a search of PubMed, they don't alias the terms. So if you search with Neanderthal with an H, you find one lot of papers. you search without the H, you find another lot of papers. It's all a bit annoying. So the discovery really began with this valley and looking at caves and rock shelters along the valley. And, and there was one particular uh, cave that was given the name the Kleiner uh, Feldhof Grotter. Um, and in the 1850s, with the Industrial Revolution kicking off in Germany, there was a demand for limestone, for lime, uh, from the, and, and quarrying began. And they started, this particular company started knocking down some of the caves, uh, removing the valley walls and so forth. And in, as a result of those kind of excavations, in 1856, in August, a skull cap and 15 postcranial bones were discovered in that particular cave. Now, initially, they were thought to be a cave bear, uh, but then a local teacher, uh, who happened to be an amateur natural historian uh, called Fulrot, he looked at them and said, well, no, these look like human. Um, and then they were scientifically reported in a publication in 1857. And that Neanderthal 1 specimen became the type specimen for the newly named species of Homo Neanderthalensis. Now it's often the case in science when someone discovers something you then suddenly find out that someone else did actually discover it first but it did, they didn't recognize its significance um, or, the, or, or, or it just got ignored or whatever and it turns out there were kind of prequels to this in that there was a Neanderthal skull discovered in Gibraltar in 1848 and one even earlier in, in Belgium and this coin here uh, shows you a pound from Gibraltar that has that Neanderthal skull on it. And uh, as a, an interesting aside, Darwin himself actually saw the Gibraltar skull, so he actually held in his hand uh, a, a Neanderthal skull. Um, although at the time, he, he may not have realized it was uh, the same as what was coming out of Neanderthal. Um, but it was, uh, at that time, very interesting because this was really the, one of the first discoveries of what, what we might call archaic human uh, remains that actually clearly look like humans but look sufficiently different and uh, to, to, to be 
uh, not the same as modern humans. Now, one of the most uh, interesting discoveries in recent years in terms of, of, of um, paleoanthropology, I think, uh, was this discovery uh, of more uh, fossil remains from the same site about 150 years later. Uh, and it still brings you know, hairs on the back of my neck go up when I realize what, you, know, you realize what they did. They went and they looked at the old records. Because there have been so much, so many things have been blown up and knocked down and whatever, they couldn't just go to the cave because it no, no, no longer existed. But they went through the old records and old, photo, old pictures and, and engravings. They tried to line up all the landmarks along the valley uh, and they worked out where they thought that original cave was and where those original result, uh, samples came from, they started digging and they found some new samples of Neanderthal. But the chilling thing was they actually found a piece of bone in those new excavations that when they put it with the old material matched perfectly, like pieces of a jigsaw going together. So the idea that you can go back to the same site 150 years later and find another bit of the very same skeleton I think is, is, is absolutely amazing. In fact, uh, there, over the years, over the 150 years or so since uh, discovery, there's now been over 400 specimens of Neanderthal uh, bones uh, found from a variety of sites across Europe and Asia. Um, and this shows you uh, the distribution of uh, most of those sites. In fact, we have now got some sites much further east than this. But you can see that they are found all over Europe um, and in parts of the, the Levant as well, parts of the Middle East as well. Uh, England is at the most northerly extent of where the Neanderthals live. And there are, have been some Neanderthal um, remains found in England, but this is the... And in fact, Neanderthal itself, the valley of Neanderthal, is right at the northern limits of where they uh, were able to live. And that grey area there is the ice sheets um, that occupied that part of Europe. Here are some um, reconstructions that have been done over the years. The early reconstruction made Neanderthals look kind of brutish, cavemen, ape men. More recent, more sympathetic uh, reconstructions, you can actually see a much more human uh, face, uh, much more intelligence and you know, even empathy in the, behind those eyes kind of thing. So the first what we might recognize as Neanderthal features, and I'll say more about what that means in a minute, are recognized about uh, 350,000 years ago. And the full-blown Neanderthal phenotype, if you like, in, in, in the skeletal remains, ranges from about 150, uh, 130,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago. Uh, died out in Asia about 50,000 years ago, and hung on in Europe, particularly in Western Europe, in Spain, and that Gibraltar, uh, those finds were uh, they actually from the very uh, late on in the in, in the time scale of Neanderthal survival, uh, just hung on there through to about twenty four thousand years ago. Now the key point is that they overlapped in time and range with anatomically modern humans. Um, we don't know at the moment. I think this is still true. We've not seen any overlap of humans and Neanderthals living in the same place at the same time. But they clearly overlapped generally. There were modern humans, anatomically modern humans in Europe at the same time as the Neanderthals. There's a characteristic culture that the archaeologists uh, recognize when they look at the tools associated with Neanderthals. They thought to have used fire, uh, thought to have buried their dead, skinned animals. There's even evidence that they cared for the injured so some of the Neanderthal remains um, are of individuals who it looks unlikely they would have been able to survive on their own uh, with uh, bad skeletal injuries that look like they've healed, so suggesting that they've been cared for. A lot of interest in this question of could they speak? Um, one of the characteristics of modern humans uh, uh, it, that allows us to speak is that this uh, the Hyoid bone has come up to support our pharynx um, and its particular shape. It turns out that Neanderthals have the same shape, hyoid bone, uh, indistinguishable from modern humans. So it's consistent with the idea that maybe they could speak, but we don't know. We won't ever know, I don't suppose. 
uh, carnivores. Uh, they ate a lot of meat. Um, there is this question, were they cannibals? So some of the remains of Neanderthals have had uh, scratchings on them as if they've been um, uh, butchered and, and chopped up. Um, those who wish to defend the Neanderthals against the charge will say, well, this is may maybe it's not that they're being eaten, it's just that there's a ritual defleshing. And I think some modern human societies do this where they actually remove the flesh from the, from the bones of a dead person um, as part of a ritual. Anatomically, they are distinct from anatomically modern humans in, in various ways. The differences are said to be greater, say, than the difference between uh, the common chimp and the bonobo. Uh, so greater than, than between those two chimp species. Much more robust than anatomically modern humans, uh, more powerfully built. A pronounced brow ridge uh, up the top there. Uh, this uh, projecting mid face and this low, flat, elongated skull. A particular feature. There's a kind of bun at the back of the head, a swelling at the back of the, of the head, the occipital bun. Uh, the chin is, is uh, largely missing, so you know, they're kind of chinless wonders in that sense. In fact, in terms of the brain size, they overlap with modern humans and in some cases exceed the average for modern humans. So they're not, they're not primitive in terms of their brain size at least. So what happened to them? They coexisted for tens of thousands of years with anatomically modern humans in Europe, and then the Neanderthals disappeared, disappeared from the fossil record. So what happened? Well, one option is that anatomically modern humans just wiped them out. Uh, they could be a kind of genocide. Uh, just as Europeans wiped out uh, native uh, natives of many different uh, parts of the globe as Europeans expanded out. Maybe that was what was going on. Another option is that they gradually went extinct. It wasn't a sudden coup. Um, they perhaps couldn't adapt to the changing climate after the end of the glaciation. Um, one suggestion is that actually humans are adapted for running, long distance running, and Neanderthals aren't, and that maybe we just outcompeted them in, in chasing down game and all that sort of stuff. There is, of course, another option, which is that they just assimilated into human populations. Um, they didn't disappear, they just got accreted into it. If you go to Portugal, for example, if you go to Lisbon, you find a lot of people there who have sickle cell disease because they have ancestors who come from Africa. There was a, a black African population in, 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 that, in Lisbon, but it got assimilated. And maybe that's what happened here with the Neanderthals. They just got assimilated into human populations. Here's a couple of papers that um, look at this issue. Neanderthal extinction by competitive exclusion, trying to argue that there was an ecological overlap and niche encroachment issues kind of thing. Another one here where they say, well, actually, you can see some evidence um, of Neanderthal features in, in some of the uh, anatomically modern uh, humans. So the key question, because I'm going to spend the rest of the talk really, really talking about sequences, um, is what about genetic exchange? So did the Neanderthals go out here, come off here early on, form a branch that then went extinct? This is our out of Africa hypothesis that we mentioned uh, in the last talk. So there was this lineage of, that led to anatomically modern humans, and then anatomically modern humans went into Eurasia, same time as an overlap with the Neanderthals, the Neanderthals died out. Or did the Neanderthals actually interbreed with anatomically modern humans before uh, they died out? So how can we address this question? There are two ways, in effect, we can look at this. We can look at current genetic information, population genetics and modern populations, and we can say, are there sequences in Europeans not found elsewhere that might be old enough to be Neanderthal in origin. And the early attempts to look at this question from uh, the mid-90s said no. They couldn't find any evidence that there was anything weird about um, population genetics in Europe that posited the need to say that Neanderthals had bred with the ancestors of Europeans. 
Um, and so a lot of interest focused on an alternative approach, which was to look at ancient DNA and to actually try and get sequences out of Neanderthal samples. Um, this is a very demanding process, very difficult process. Um, initially required amplification by PCR with the problems of potential contamination and so forth. Um, but nonetheless, uh, people have done it and have succeeded in doing it. Now the first target that people looked at was mitochondria. So mitochondria are an attractive <coughs> target if you're trying to do ancient historical studies on human DNA, or in fact any organism, because they, they have multiple copies, hundreds to tens of thousands of copies per cell. So a gene in the nuclear genome, there might be one copy, and a gene in the mitochondria, and you'll have a, at least a hundredfold more copies. So you're stacking the odds in your favor if you're trying to recover DNA from old damaged samples. There's a particular loop in the uh, mitochondrial genome called the D loop, which doesn't encode any proteins, um, and therefore actually evolves very quickly. So this is useful as well because it, it allows you to um, classify uh, the samples, the sequences you're getting um, into different lineages, human lineages, uh, and so forth. And the other thing is it kind of gives a clean result because it's coming on the maternal line. Sorry, you think that's um, question. You're prejudging the lecture. Okay. You're trying to give away the, the story before. I'm just okay, building okay. up and telling the story. <laughs> but yes, be excited. Be very excited about what's to come. <laughs> so, the very first papers in the 1990s <laughs> said, look, we got some Neanderthal DNA sequences. We, we sequence them, we examine them, we draw a tree, and look, they fall well outside the range of modern humans. So we've got all our lust European heat lucky humans mixed in with one small branch coming out of Africa. So this diversity in Africa, but the Neanderthals are way outside of all that. You can see the last name there, which is a name that will that reverberates through this field. Svante Pabo is a Swedish um, <coughs> paleoanthropologist, uh, sequence uh, kind of guru. Um, and this is what they said at the end of their abstract. This suggests that Neanderthals went extinct without contributing mitochondrial DNA to modern humans. And uh, as the field progressed, more samples, more sequences. You could argue the very first sequences, well, maybe they're just errors. Maybe the DNA's got degraded and it's giving you bad sequences uh, that... that just by chance appear to be outside the human um, uh, population. But more and more sequences came along. So here we are by uh, 2004, 24 Neanderthal sequences and 40 early modern human remains were compared and they basically came to the same conclusion that Neanderthals sat outside um, the variation we see in modern humans. Um, and one argument is, oh, well, any old D DNA that's been degraded, it's going to look different, and that's what's given it. But you can take DNA from anatomically modern humans of similar kind of vintage, ten thousands, tens of thousands of years old, sequence that, and it does still fall nicely within what we see in modern populations. It gives a consistent result. So it really did look that there was this discontinuity. Um, in fact, I just put this in because this paper came out the other day. Uh, it's a little bit of an aside here, but it, this is just to remind, to go back to what we said in the previous talk about um, the, uh, the early Europeans. Here's a, 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 a genome uh, uh, from uh, a 7,000 year old European, and the evidence is that that European had dark skin, um, but had some more modern, what we consider to be more modern um, pathogen resistance genes. So that's kind of interesting. But that's just an aside, actually. I'll put that in because I just saw that paper. But continuing in the story of Neanderthals, Neanderthals, as I said earlier, they occupied this region of Europe, but there were some discoveries of Neanderthals even far out in, in Asia, in, in Siberia. Um, 
quite a long way further out than we ever expected to see them. Um, and DNA was collected from those, and they also fell within a, a clade of Neanderthal sequences that was different from that of modern humans. And this, I think, I think it was 2000 and, oh, 2008, this one. This was the consensus view there. Um, so at the top here we have a number of sites. This is the Cambridge reference sequence, as it's called. It's a, the, mitochondri the human mitochondrial sequence everyone accepts as the, as, the, as the standard one. And there are all these differences here between these Neanderthal samples from that. And in most of the cases, not all, but most of the cases, you can see the Neanderthals are all agreeing with each other. They have an A there. Uh, and let's see what that says. There, uh, to see there in, in, the, in, in modern humans. And so we were getting a consistent picture here to say that they were a different species. They were not the same as us. Um, uh, and uh, quite different from all present human mitochondrial DNA sequences and the, the, the few dozen now uh, ancient mitochondrial DNA sequences from anatomically modern humans. So people just said, okay, that's it then. They, they didn't breed, to breed with us, two separate species, uh, quite consistent with our out-of-Africa hypothesis. Our ancestors walked out of Africa 60,000 years ago uh, and had nothing to do with the, the Neanderthals apart from making them extinct. Well, in 2006, um, Svante Pebo and others took us into a new era again. So getting bits of mitochondrial sequence was one thing, but they took on the much harder challenge of can we actually get the nuclear genome, can we actually get real widespread genomic information, genome sequences out of Neanderthals. And they managed to get uh, a million base pairs of sequence from a Neanderthal sample. In fact, there were two papers that came out about the same time. One got a million and one got 60 60 odd thousand base pairs of sequence. And they were able to, uh, as a result of that, they were able to um, say that uh, Neanderthals were quite separate from us. Uh, in many of those nuclear sequences, they showed that they were different uh, from anatomically modern humans. But they were quite careful what they said about admixture. So they said things like, you know, it's got to be fairly rare. Um, if it did occur, then we'd see stuff in Europeans in the Neanderthals that weren't present in others, and we didn't see, they didn't see that. Um, they, they said the confidence limits are 0 to 20%, so a definitive answer will have to wait. Uh, that's in one paper. In the other paper, they said um, more extensive sequencing is necessary to address this possibility that there, were, there was admixture. As, a, as part of this process of trying to work out what mitochondria, what the Neanderthals looked like, they actually then started pulling out entire mitochondrial genome sequences from Neanderthals. Um, and there were some differences in protein coding genes that they interpreted as well. Maybe these are adaptations to the Neanderthal lifestyle and so forth. Um, but th those whole Neanderthal mitochondria still were consistent with and in fact supportive of the idea that they were separate species, no interbreeding. But as a result of determining the mitochondrial sequence accurately, they could then go back and look at the previous study where they tried to get a million base pairs um, and they looked at it again and they said, well actually there's a lot of contamination uh, from anatomically modern humans in these samples and, and we need to do better uh, particularly if we're going to look at this admixture issue and work out whether there is or is not uh, any kind of um, mixture. And then um, we fast forward to 2010 when they finally did publish this draft sequence, fairly low coverage, but a draft sequence on this of, of the Neanderthal genome. And I think you know, this is an amazing step forward that we can actually, it wasn't that long ago in, in my lifetime that that we got human genome sequence for the first time. And the fact that we can now actually recover a Neanderthal genome from um, uh, tens of thousands of years ago, I think is a, an amazing find. So what did they discover when they actually looked into this issue? Again, you can see Svante Pebo is the, the last author there. 
So they found um, that there were a number of base substitutions that changed protein sequences in our lineage. So they can start to shed light on what actually makes anatomically new modern humans different from Neanderthals. And, you know, we like to think that we are special. Maybe we're just different, but we like to think we're special. So what, we've got some clues on that. But the key question is, so are the Neanderthals really closely related to some anatomically modern humans more than others? Um, now that's the, the nub of the question, was there interbreeding? So what they did was they compared the sites that had what we might call derived SNPs. So these are SNPs that are found in us and Neanderthals, but not in chimpanzees. And they compared that to uh, a couple of European Americans, a couple of East Asians, a, couple of West, a few West Africans. And what they found was that there were significant close... Neanderthals are significantly closer to the non-African populations, these East Asians and these European Americans, than they were to the West Africans. So everyone at that stage, up to that stage of being thinking Neanderthals went into Europe and they met Europeans, and that's what happened. What this was saying was actually it must have been, if there was any mixing, it was just as humans were leaving Africa or while they were still in parts of East Africa, because all non-Africans have, uh, have this signature of being slightly closer to the end. They then compared uh, the, the sequence with the San, which we mentioned, the, the, well, sometimes known as the Bushman, Yoruba. Han is um, a name for Chinese, the largest Chinese ethnic group, uh, French people and Papuans. And they were able to show that there had been uh, flow from Neanderthals to non-African humans. Um, one of those European-American genomes was Craig Venter, who you may have heard of, and uh, so people made the point that there were segments of Craig Venter's genome that were more Neanderthal than they were African. And the kind of figure that they settled on was some, a few percent, between one and four percent of non-African genomes, genomes like people like me would have, is Neanderthal. So the conclusion that came out of that first paper was that we're looking at this kind of phylogeny. So Neanderthal split off from anatomically modern humans, the common ancestor, 400,000 years ago, let's say, something like that. Anatomically modern humans diverged, the San, as we saw, was the earliest branch. Then you've got these other branches, this West other Africans here, and then somewhere here, this is the group that's leaving Africa, the uh, Neanderthals made a contribution to the gene pool of all non-Africans, you know, including Papua New Guineans, Chinese, and Europeans. There have been many studies now in, in the recent years trying to fine-tune this, and we now, in a more nuanced view, we recognize that there are higher levels of Neanderthal ancestry in East Asians, Chinese, uh, and so on, than there are in Europeans. So not only was our intuition that, oh, Neanderthals must have bred with, with Europeans wrong, because Neanderthals are present in all non-Africans, but in fact there's more Neanderthal uh, in, in Asia than there is in, in Europe, which is, again is an interesting finding. Now, having got to the level of genome coverage of Neanderthals and being able to actually recover ancient DNA from Neanderthals, the interesting question is, can we actually look at these molecules, look at these gene sequences, and actually tell anything about what Neanderthals were like? And uh, alongside the efforts to get a genome sequence, there were efforts to look at individual genes in a very directed way, um, and not just genes. So this is actually looking um, at a particular... Uh, sialic acid. Um, so humans uh, actually differ from um, most other mammals, well all other mammals, they were sort of the, uh, the ancestral ma mammal phenotype, um, because we lack this one particular um, sialic acid derivative. Um, and if we look here, we've got this new 5GC uh, peak here, present in orangs, bonobos, chimps, but absent in humans. And the larger peak here is the, is the one that we still retain. So this 
lack of this particular molecule is a signature of anatomically modern humans compared to uh, our uh, current extant relatives. When you look at Neanderthals, you find the same thing, that there's actually nothing no significant peak there in Neanderthals. So Neanderthals, so the inactivation of this particular uh, enzyme uh, occurred prior to um, the, the development of the human Neanderthal ancestor. Another interesting paper, they looked at this particular receptor gene, a uh, receptor gene that's involved in skin pigmentation, uh, the melanocortin-1 receptor. And they showed that... Um, the Neanderthal sequence was different from all modern human sequences, but actually introduced a, uh, a coding change in the amino acids that actually had um, like to have a functional uh, consequence. So this variant reduces the activity in, in when they looked at tissue culture, trying to clone this variant into tissue culture cells and so forth, um, and. Their conclusion was that this um, inactivation of this particular receptor underlay uh, humans, modern European humans and, uh, and Neanderthals, having this pale skin colour and red hair. Um, and so that's why we now accept that some Neanderthals probably did have red hair and pale skin. Whether it's true of all Neanderthals, I'm not sure. Uh, Here's a few other papers which uh, have looked at this. Um, I'm not going to go through them all in detail. Uh, FOXP2 is a very sexy gene in that that's supposed to be a, a gene associated with the development of language in humans. Um, and we know that Neanderthals have the same gene um, as we do, uh, compared to the chimpanzee, which has two amino acids different in terms of the protein coding sequence. Uh, this paper came out... Uh, Couple of, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, and this is taking this fine-grained view of Neanderthal, Neanderthal ancestry um, much further forward. So they're going through it and actually looking. No, this one actually came out yesterday. This came out yesterday. Um, in this week's lecture, um, what what they found when they looked carefully along each chromosome and looking to see. Uh, which parts of the chromosomes have got Neanderthal ancestry and which ones haven't, they found some areas that you might call Neanderthal deserts, where there was no Neanderthal stuff, and other parts where there was a lot more uh, Neanderthal. Um, and, and it says here that, that the genes that are highly expressed, uh, more expressed in testes than any other tissue, are especially re reduced in Neanderthal ancestry, and there's an approximately five-fold reduction of Neanderthal ancestry on the X chromosome. Um, and what they interpret that to mean is that there was a fitness cost. So when you have a uh, Neanderthal X chromosome in a male without any modern human X chromosome there, 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 there was a fitness cost. So that was, uh, um, that it, that those kind of individuals were less fit reproductively. In fact, I just saw this morning, uh, there's actually a commentary on the paper, one of the related paper in science. Um, and there's a guy, John Hawkes, who's a very keen blogger and a, uh, one of the experts in this field. And he, he was a bit scathing about this. He said this, you could call this the Neanderthal mule hypothesis, which basically when modern humans and Neanderthals interbred, the offspring were less fit, uh, uh, like mules are able to reproduce. They weren't completely infertile, obviously, otherwise there wouldn't be any admixture, but they were less fit. And he says, well, there may be other explanations, um, selection for various loci, uh, stochastic effects or whatever. But this is the, uh, it's in Nature This Week making this claim. And just to show as um, great ideas or, you know, often uh, come at the same time, great breakthroughs. A paper appeared in Science Express uh, in the last 24 hours as well, um, showing that uh, looking here at 379 European and 286 East Africa, Asian uh, individuals. Here they attempted a kind of de novo approach where they just looked for region, looked at the regions in modern humans and tried to get patterns of ancestry of different uh, parts of the genome without actually initially comparing it with the Neanderthal genome. Then they went um, and did that comparison and showed that they were thinking along the right lines. 
They also make this case that there must be fitness costs to this hybridization, which is not unexpected. If you take sort of diverging subspecies in animals and then you cross them again, there often is, as they're on their way, part way towards becoming species, there is often uh, a fitness cost there. Interestingly, many of the loci involved in skin phenotypes, uh, not just in skin pigmentation, but things like keratin, uh, alleles in keratin and so forth, appear to have been coming into these uh, non-African um, modern humans uh, from Neanderthals. So uh, that, again, the idea that Europeans went white because they bred with Neanderthals, I mean, that's a gross simplification, but it's, uh, there, there, there is some, uh, perhaps some, uh, truth to that as well. Okay. The lady there, are you excited then? Is that interesting? I was just still wondering whether a lot of things that we get through the mitochondria through the Neanderthals and what our lineage now, whether that is going to come in more strong with that as well? Or just so, there's no, so there's no, at the moment, we have no evidence any modern human with a Neanderthal mitochondrial phenotype. So the only evidence for this admixture is in the nuclear genome. But the interesting thing is that we... I'm saying, was there any more kind of strong characteristics of the Neanderthals gene? No. Like, do we know that? Well, not the sorts of things I just mentioned. So there seems to be uh, an overabundance of genes, alleles associated with skin, uh, with testes, uh, reproduction, uh, there is some evidence, I think I've left the slide out, I did have an earlier slide, that some immune alleles, some of the MHC alleles that we see in, in, in non Africans have actually come from these archaic lineages as well. So, so. What about like the reasoning, like learning that kind of stuff? This is where there's a huge gulf between looking at molecules and actually looking at psychology and culture, and even among anatomically modern humans, trying to work out what the basis is for psychological dispositions and so forth, and looking at their genomes is a fraught area. So I think we have to be very careful about interpreting anything. The null hypothesis is that Neanderthals are the same as us, I guess. That would be one way of looking at it. Um, maybe there weren't any differences. It's a, it's a very difficult and a lot of political political correctness around this issue as well as to whether we can even discuss these kind of things. You know. Anyway, I hope I've got you excited because now we're going to get even more excited. Okay, so this is, is David Tennant playing Hamlet. That's actually a, a, some guy left his skull when he died. He said he wanted his skull to actually be put into Hamlet and used in Hamlet. You know, some people have strange wishes for their afterlife. So there he is holding that skull. And there's this line from Hamlet, which I think is particularly poignant here, because, okay, we, see the, we look at the fossils, we see Neanderthals, we see anatomically modern humans, we've gone on about mixing together. But there was a discovery in a cave in Siberia of a little finger bone. There it is. That's a model of it. It's not the actual finger bone they took it from. But just to give you a perspective, I actually m m discussed this once with Alice Roberts uh, and she dismissed it, said it's just a little finger bone. And I said, well, actually, it's a whole genome uh, to us who look at sequences. It may be just nothing to us, someone who looks at skeletons. This story begins when they actually found a mitochondrial genome, um, mitochondrial sequences from this finger bone. And these diverge so much from anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals that they said, this is a new lineage. Uh, now, they were very careful. They didn't want to upset all the taxonomists or get into f arguments about whether this is a new species or not. So they refused to give it a Latin name. They called them Denisova hominins or Denisovans. Um, and that's just the term that's been used up uh, since then. Um, and they, they estimated that there was an ancestor about a million years ago. Um, so there was a different kind of human, <coughs> nothing like, we had no idea what they looked like, but separate from us and the Neanderthals, living way out there in um, southern Siberia, which is an amazing finding. Uh, here's 
Uh, you can see on the map quite how far away it is from Africa and from Europe. And you can also see here, these are, this is all us lot, all us modern humans up here. There's the Neanderthals that we now recognize. They're quite a distinct place. They are different lineage, but they have entered things present us. And then we have these, this Denisova a mitochondrial sequence way out here. So this was an amazing find. Uh, but they then, you know, everyone keeps upping the ante in this game. They then went on and extracted more DNA and ended up getting a whole genome, uh, 1.9 fold coverage from this, just from a finger bone. Um, so that is a, 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 an amazing finding. They, on, on the basis of the whole genome, they then could say, well, actually, they, bear, they have a common origin with Neanderthals. So basically, the branch order was the ancestor of the Denisovans and uh, Neanderthals branched off first, and then that branch split to give the, the Denisovans and Neanderthals. But it's a very deep branch, deep split in that branch. Wasn't involved this population in spreading genes from Neanderthals into Eurasia. But they found from genome comparisons that about 4 to 6 percent of the genetic material from, from this Denisovan was found in present day Melanesians, people from Papua New Guinea and the, those islands around there. Um, so, again, that, if you look at the map, that's a pretty weird finding that you're getting this up here, and then down here, is your, you'll find your genetic evidence of admixture. But that's what the, the evidence was telling us. In that cave, the Denisova cave, they also found a tooth. So there was this finger bone and a tooth, and the mitochondrial genome in the tooth was also very similar to that in the finger bone. Um, and they looked at the tooth, and they couldn't really make any much sense of it in telling us what kind of, what kind of morphology this individual had. So, if we look at where we were... Every year I give this talk, I have to update it, but this is where we were, I think, two years ago. So we have anatomically modern humans. There's me up there. There's Neanderthals. So a bit of me's coming from Neanderthal. And if any of you are Papuan, I don't think anyone is, you will have Denisovan ancestry. Towards this. People then did the same kinds of things with Denisovan uh, genes as they did with Neanderthals, and they found here that one particular HLA um, allele was found very commonly uh, in West Asia, and they said that this is probably due to its admixture coming in from the Denisovans as part of that interbreeding. First genome on the Denisovan was uh, just one or two two fold coverage. We now have just recently got this 30-fold coverage. Um, I think this came out in early, early this month, about three weeks ago. Again, some Santi Pebo's uh, group. So what they could uh, do when they got to this level of genetic, uh, of genome coverage, they could estimate the, the heterozygosity within the individual. So wherever you've got two alleles, one on each chromosome, one for the mother, one for the father, you can work out are they the same or different and how does that relate to what we see in modern humans in terms of the amount of heterozygosity. And what they showed basically was that there was um, very low heterozygosity, a lot of inbreeding had been going on in this population, very small population size. Um, and then they also allowed uh, some dating to go on uh, and catalog the genetic changes that have swept to uh, high frequency in modern humans since the Denisovans. Uh, so here are some of the the findings they had there. Um, actually, no, this is an older paper. I'm getting, I should have put the dates of these papers. But here, I, I'm not going to go through them. Here are the various genes. It's a catalogue of genes we're now starting to get. One here, this CNT uh, NAP2, is actually associated with susceptibility to language disorders. And therefore, again, this is one of those things where maybe this is something that makes us distinctly human in our ability to speak and so forth. This is the one that came out a few, uh, a few weeks ago. They actually looked in this cave in Denisova. They found all these remains. 
some of the remains were not Denisovan, there's only that finger bone and the tooth, but there was actually some remains that looked, um, I think this was a, I don't remember what this is from now, I think this is from a foot bone. Um, they extracted DNA, they sequenced it, and they got a Neanderthal sequence. Uh, they were very surprised that this thing actually, so in the same cave you've got one lineage, the Denisovans, and then uh, not the same time, not from, they didn't overlap in terms of, of time, but they're able to look at this lineage in, in more detail and do um, an other analyses. And again, they found that there was interbreeding between uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals. And in fact, they've now come up, just in the last few months now, come up with this new scenario, which is that there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans. So there's interbreeding between Denisovans and uh, humans in the lineage going off to Oceania. So Australian Aborigines are now known to have a lot of Denisovan ancestry in them. There were the Neanderthals coming in here to interbreed with all of us who, people who descend from the, the out of Africa migration. And they found evidence from looking at the genomes that there was another lineage buried in those genomes, not found in a pure form in any sample, but there was evidence that there would have been another lineage uh, in the past uh, that, that explained some of the features they saw in the Denisovan genome. So we're kind of in a Planet of the Apes situation here now, that, or, or you know, Star Trek, where you've got multiple different hominin races that, or, or different kinds of lineages, all on the, same, uh, on the planet at the same time and interbreeding uh, uh, to small amounts. So uh, you know, we've, we've come an astonishingly long way. So I'm going to finish up now. We've now got multiple Neanderthal mitochondrial genomes. And they, at the moment, they still show no similarities to anything in anatomically modern humans. There's separation in the mitochondrial images between the two groups. We now have a Neanderthal genome sequence. We have multiple, actually. I think we've got three now, which support the idea of small-scale mixing. So a few percent, I think most of the people in this room, around the room, in fact everyone in the room, we all have a bit of, mit a bit of Neanderthal in our genome. Um, we've got some evidence of what Neanderthals were like in terms of their phenotype as deduced from their genotype. And we now know that there have been these other uh, archaic uh, human lineages, Denisovans, and an, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be necessarily African population, another population uh, has been uh, interbreeding. And we, the thing about this field, if we come back in a year's time, or five years' time, it's gonna, there's going to be more and more information. Um, going back to what we were saying earlier, it, it wouldn't be uh, impossible that if we sequence enough hu modern humans, we might find a Neanderthal mitochondrial sequence. Uh, as we said in the last talk, I think, they, they found uh, a very highly divergent lineage in an African-American, uh, just who'd gone for, you know, into one of these ancestry uh, tests. Um, and so, you know, we just don't know what the future holds, but it's been a fascinating few years. Of course, in the West Midlands, are we really surprised? Uh, Ozzy Osbourne had his genome sequenced uh, a couple of years ago. Are you really surprised that this man does, has any Neanderthal sequence? I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, not too surprising. And that's just, I just used a load of images. So um, that's me finished. I'm happy to take any questions. What I'm... Also interested to do, if someone wants to send me an email, I'll send you a link to a Dropbox that contains all the papers that I've spoken about, um, if, you want, if you want that. Um, the University of Birmingham seems to have got very picky about whether you can put up PDFs on websites, which is a bit silly, I think.